Greetings, true believers, and welcome to episode two of the Polis Podcast, season two, a bi-weekly show about comics, pop culture, and faith. My name is Chris Poirier, and with me, but socially distanced by about a couple hundred miles, as always, is Hector. How's it going, Hector? We were social distancing before it was cool. We were way before it was <laughs> cool. Um, but here here we are, COVID-19, um, doing life from our homes and podcasts. But here we are, and we know we've been out a few weeks, and I- I'm sorry. Um, I had a bunch of stuff kind of get thrown at me all at once, as a lot of us did. So life happens, and so do comics. But we want to talk about and catch everybody up because there's a lot going on in comics. So strap yourselves in and prepare yourself for We've Got Comic Sign. On today's episode of The Pull List, we have a wonderful socially distant show for you. No sana- hand sanitizer required, no mask, but we're going to hit all the latest... What? If you're listening to this on your headphones, though, you should probably uh, like wipe some hand sanitizer on your headphones every now and again, though. Just Yeah, and, and then wash your hands like twice, because it's just a good practice at this point. Um, But yeah, we have a great show, and we want to talk about everything that's been going on in the comic book industry, which is a lot as we said at the top of the show, and we want to talk about our poll recommendations, the things that we've enjoyed over the last couple weeks, and our favorite number ones, because there were a few. There weren't a ton, but there was some cool stuff that came out, and we just want to take a quick moment and talk about this whole COVID-19 thing and just where the comic book industry is. This is the Polis Podcast. Let's jump on in to kind of the news slash topic of the day. And if you've kind of been living, peeking out from your shades of your home, you know that there's this thing called the coronavirus. And most of us across the country are in different forms of shelter in place, stay at home, wash our hands, do all the good things. We don't want to get sick. And as a result of that, the comic book industry kind of went through a roller coaster of emotions over the last three to four weeks that... There's just no other way to describe that. It's it's really wild what occurred. And I'll kind of take our news list in reverse order to set up for you guys as best as I can kind of what happened. <clears throat> Excuse me. That That's not the COVID. You, you don't have it now and I don't have it. About a month ago when things started really to hit and some states were being proactive on doing shelter-in-place orders or shutdown orders, Diamond, the primary distributor the distributor don't don't mishear that there is no one else it is diamond comics uh decided to shutter their operation for at least a month if not longer and there's a lot of different things that came into that a lot of folks were kind of like well why did the distributor back out first and that spun a lot of folks into questions about did the publisher say something um are books not coming and Really, the truth behind a lot of that is is Diamond has warehouses across the country. It's how they get us comics. And they have people that work for those companies. I know that's a shock to some. And as places were being impacted, a lot of folks had childcare issues, just like all of us, that suddenly kids were home from school, and they had a lot of people that weren't able to continue to work, which meant their warehouse operations were starting to suffer. And before things really went into complete lockdown in a lot of the places their warehouses were, they were starting to fall behind on orders just getting stuff shipped. And they were like, we should probably get ahead of this before it gets worse. So there's some logic, obviously, to that. And a lot of people are trying to hang you know, what's appearing to be this looming cloud of the destruction of the comic book industry on diamond folding first. But... There are practical reasons why they did what they did. Obviously. The, and and the thing... Yeah, go ahead. Let's just... Realistically, you can substitute Diamond for almost every other entity and industry right now. Yep. Like... Absolutely. Um, Just because you have to shut down right now, yes, it will have an adverse effect on your future. But, like, there's not, like, exactly a lot of options, you know? My church, right. you know, dealing with that as a pastor, like, 
we aren't a church that holds on to money or has a savings account or anything like that. Like <laughs> we put I feel our money, that reality. We put a money, our, our money into ministry and it's just like real yep. talk. We're like, mm, this could get scary real fast. And I'm like, none of us are sitting around like, Oh, it's the end of our church. It's just like, okay, right. we might not get paid for this <laughs> on <laughs> the, on the flip side, diamond, you know, their business, there are a lot of businesses, a lot of local restaurants in my area, comic book shops in general, that yep. this the whole idea of shutting down is big and honestly i'm kind of grateful for diamond doing it because if they did it the way they did it you know that forced other companies to actually check themselves right and that's kind of you know as this conversation continues was one of the immediate things that occurred in that was all the retailers going well uh, you guys the publishers, DC, Marvel, Image, et cetera, et cetera, you have new books, right? And they're like, well, yeah, you know how this works. Books are a little over a month out. Um, so yeah, and they're like, well, if we if he can't get books, then we don't have a lot to sell other than back issues and everything else in our shops. And so what are we going to do? And that conversation was pretty educational in the early days of this because – Diamond as the sole distributor, um, technically in their contracts, have anti-competition. Like, technically, a bunch of lawyers started staring at stuff going, well, can we direct ship legally underneath the existing contracts? And the answer to that is sort of, <laughs> um, to be completely honest. And that's why that got complicated quickly. And then... A few more days passed, and a few other folks uh, came into the fray. Um, a comic book store owner also has a point-of-sale customer resource management tool called Comic Hub that a lot of folks had started using over the years that said that he had a solution to this problem because, obviously, one of the biggest issues in the middle of this conversation was digital comics versus print comics. DC, Marvel, all those guys have digital product, and... Like I said, they have new books in their quivers that they can fire and get to the industry, but the retailers were afraid, well, if we get everybody hooked on digital now, why why do I exist? And so Comic Hub was like, well, what if we sell digital first with the promise of follow-on physical product? Um, not a terrible solution, to be honest. You know, we need to be creative that technically with comic book stores losing new product a lot of stores today are either all new product or all old product and there are a lot of folks that are balanced stores that have both but there's a lot of comic shops that exist solely because of what they sell week to week and if stuff isn't coming that means they're not making money um so this became really complicated really quick and so everyone was firing solutions into the thing. Ultimately, the Comics Hub thing turned out to be that most publishers actually hadn't made an agreement with this particular individual and his product. So the idea of having the ability to make money off from selling digital first kind of disappeared. And what followed was the major publishers basically saying that they aren't – they're going to hold digital um, and not ship product that everybody just kind of hit the pause button, which is going to have a lot of different impacts to the industry. That Marvel just recently said no new digital titles, and they're pausing May and June, about a third of the product line. Um, and we just don't know what that means. DC is still kind of going back and forth, but for the time being, they've promised not to do digital First, and most of the third parties of Image, Valiant, Boom, etc. have all said, yeah, we hear you, retailers. We don't want to necessarily create competition basically with yourself. And it's been really wild since then because stores are just like every other small business in this COVID-19 situation where we have local – uh, shutdowns or lockdowns or shelter in place orders, you know, comics are apparently not essential in most places, which I think all of us understand. Well, we there's actually but... <laughs> a case in one of my actual local shops, um, Ooh. like went legal and like went through all the stuff and pulled out why they're essential. 
and <laughs> it got checked legally and passed. Nice. So, um, because because what interesting. They, yeah, what, interesting what they enough. Do for the community we had the same stuff. thing. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Because they provide I, reading materials for kids. They have uh, like educational nice. stuff in the store as well. Um, there's they stayed open. We kind of did the same thing locally here is we just recently got our shelter in place order here in Georgia and everyone read it and went, oh, it doesn't actually tell you the shelter in place. It tells you to do what we've been doing all along, which is weird that you called it a shelter in place order. But here we are. Um, well, that's what they did here, our, too. Our, they Everybody was <laughs> saying it was shelter in place, but it was really a stay at home order, which is like the double secret probation before shelter in place. Right. And very similar, that's that's what happened here because everyone started reading it and the non-essential section next to the essential section literally read the same. And all of us went, wait, what? And sure enough, uh, enough people asked and the governor confirmed that, oh yeah, if you follow CDC guidance and social distancing, uh, your business is essential because that's how you money make. Oh, okay then. <laughs> Um, but we know that there are places that have straight up been told, nope, you you got to find other ways. And what's really awesome is the industry didn't lose a beat. Um, Facebook groups started popping up that included everybody from artists, writers, publishers, retail store owners, like everybody. Um, and they started talking about, okay, what do we do now? And so discussions on returning to direct distribution have been had. Um, there are rumors of game distributors in the United States um, who aren't Alliance because Alliance is owned by Diamond and they close to. Um, we're like, well, we probably could come up with a model fairly quickly. So the complaints that you might have heard us make over the years or if you've heard from your local shop or you experienced, um, Diamond might finally have some competition coming, but literally none of us know what that looks like at this time. But the conversations are now much more serious than they've ever been because they literally lost their distribution backbone for the entire, well, technically, I think most of the overseas markets gets most of their stuff through Diamond as well, that they have a couple one-offs or direct distributorships. But I mean, if you want to know how the comic book industry works, you're getting a masterclass in it right now because everybody is talking about it. And then just to make things worse, unfortunately, just about every convention between point A and point B to the end of this year got canceled as well, leaving a majority of the fandom without new content, without their outlet, um, but with a bunch of cool podcasts. <laughs> uh? Huh? Yeah. But we also have no new books to read, so we're going to be working on that. But we think we're going to try to interview a lot of the people impacted by this is I, kind of my personal goal of how we'll spend our COVID-19 time is we can talk a lot about what comics truly are to a lot of different people and what they're doing. So be on the lookout for that in the future because, yeah, after this episode, we're not going to have a lot of new books to talk about for at least two months, if not longer. Um, but let's take kind of that moment to transition into why this is good um, and what good is taking place. And let me just tell you that from being in some of those groups and talking with a lot of my friends that a, the industry coming together, including at the publisher level um, amongst a lot of the third party folks, we see this as a, we, we got to do what we got to do to keep the thing that we all love as fans and creators. And there's a ton of independent GoFundMes or support um, things that have been set up for people to be able to hopefully bail out some shops that just are going to be up against the wall. DC donated already about a quarter million dollars to one of those funds. I know that uh, Dinesh and Bad Idea was literally supposed to launch right now, and they are holding back their launch and are promising now to qua I double or quadruple their initial launch. Um, and they have sent two hundred and fifty dollars to every store that signed on initially of basically money they don't have. They haven't sold any product yet. <laughs> As a thank you for being someone that believed in us, and we're gonna get there, but we believe in you. Um, 
Jim Lee is putting up a ton of his personal art to be auctioned and then be donated on top of what DC's already done. I believe Marvel has made a couple payments into those. And just seeing the people come together to save this thing that we all love is is really cool to watch. And if you guys are looking for those ways to do something, some of my best advice is most artists are opening up their commission schedules right now um, or have started Patreons if they didn't have them. Support the folks that you like and support your local shops because a lot of them are going online to eBay to sell back issues or any special edition stuff that they have. That Or a lot of places are just selling literally like Corona bonds, so gift certificates to help them get cash flow while things are slow right now until we can get back in the shop. So comics, as Hector and I have always said, is this gigantic, amazing community and it's still doing amazing community things. So if you don't know what to do, just reach out to your local shop, your favorite artist, their favorite writer. Everybody's doing something right now to help comics continue to be comics. And when, that's one of the things that I just did. makes me happy. The day before, like when we heard that the our stay at home orders or whatever were coming and that comics were stopping, literally mm. that Wednesday... And, you know, I know I'm the bad guy in this, especially at this current climate. Um, How dare but, you? Uh, for a bulk of my comics, I know heresy and heresy incoming. Uh, I do. <laughs> uh, I do buy digital. Um, How dare just be- you? Uh, because one, my life is crazy. I don't have a shop That's within fair. 45 minutes of either direction. And uh, so getting out there to do them. Or with my schedule is not always easy. Plus, my storage building, like where I keep my comics, is overflowing, and I have to be selective. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, because I have bought a ton of my comics in the recent months digitally, um, when I heard this was coming down, um, me and my kids uh, went and drove to the very distant uh comic shops and this was our first outing out of the house after the whole thing started so we'd been Mm -hmm. home for almost two weeks without leaving the house and then uh you know we straight drove like an entire day driving 45 minutes in one way we bought as much comics at one store as we could and then um we drove 45 minutes another way and then uh point this out too um there's a comic book artist uh, and this is one of the coolest things, and I forgot to tell you this. Um, hmm. There's, you know, how they're doing these like young adult graphic novels of like alternate histories of the DC characters. Yes, they're, that's DC's attempt to open up the young adult line and everything. Yeah. Okay, so there's an artist who did the Bruce Wayne one, where he it's like a reddish cover. And he's in front of a car, and yep. it's. Um, okay, whatever issue that one is, he's all, and that same artist also did a DC Superhero Girl book. Um, that artist put on Facebook and their socials um, that if they had any copies in store of her books, that she would buy them back at cost from the shops. Yep. And then she did that. And then told them to give them away to kids. Yeah, actually, that's a really good thing because to my local shop mentioned seeing something similar where shops are also doing the thing of you can buy $25, $50, $75, or $100 worth of back issue comics. And you're literally telling the owner to set aside that number of back issue comics and they'll literally give them away to children as they come in because free comic book day has already been canceled, which is supposed to be the first Saturday in May. Mm -hmm. Um, And so everyone's like, so how are we keeping people interested? So that's something that my local shop's doing. And I know some others have talked about it is let's share the love of comics by, if you want to know how to support me, throw me 50 bucks and I'll go pull 50 bucks worth of comics out of the back issues and set them aside so we can give those out. If we see kids or if, People come and do curbside pickup. We'll throw a couple extra comics in for kids and whatnot. So again, I I love this industry because this is how much people care about the medium, 
and the folks involved in it. And there's so many different creative ways that people are looking to, you know, keep us afloat. And it's worth at least mentioning here because we do a lot on the other side of the Love Thy Nerd podcast network with gaming that um, tabletop gaming is going through the exact same problem. And stuff is not easy across the industry right now. So friendly local game stores are going through very similar things with not being able to get new product or just be open. Because the first thing that happened here is our store had to close their public gaming area because it's like, yeah, that's going to be lots of nerds coughing on top of each other. That's probably a bad look. Good point. Um, That just like with churches, like Hector mentioned early, that one of the first things we had to adjust to is our communities. And we're very people people. Yeah, that works, right? Mm -hmm. Um. And we just crave being around other human beings, and we've just been thrown into this thing where, nope, no peoples. And we've had to adjust, as everyone saw of, you know, we're all doing things on our computers now through Zoom or through Google Hangouts or Facebook Messenger or whatever video thing you're you're doing that trying to figure all these things out have been changing. So we're here. We love the comic book industry, and we're going to continue to talk about this throughout um, COVID, but we're hoping to bring, like I said, some folks in so we can talk about what's in, what's happening, the actual impacts to some of the people that are doing things, and also what everybody's trying to do to just continue to be the awesome community that comics are. So, I think for right now, uh, that's what you need to know, which is a lot, and we thank you guys for, you know, hanging out for all of our industry news and insider stuff, but you can... T- Come and talk with us on the Love Thy Nerd Facebook community about all this, and we've been talking about it already, but we want to spend the rest of the show talking about the comics that we do have (laughs) from the last three weeks, so we can give you guys a couple ideas for if you can still get to your store, which I know is becoming much more limited, or if you can at least get mail order or curbside pickup, we can tell you what over the last three weeks have really excited us. So Hector, how about you kick us off with what really kind of stood out to you for your top four pulls from the last couple weeks? I'm just going to go throw it out there that my top pull would be Curse of the White Knight number eight, but you took it. So, you know, whatever. <laughs> Douche waffle. Fight me. Um, Fight. Aww. <laughs> but uh, so directly under that, I will strongly say that DC Unkillables is flipping amazing it uh is a really great continuation of wait did i say unkillables no deceased mm-hmm. unkillables not dc unkillables um there de- you go deceased unkillables dude is fantastic um it is a direct sequel to deceased um and it's dealing with the people that were left on earth um right which okay. is mainly a handful of superheroes and a whole squad of opportunistic supervillains. Um, you get honestly some of the best Cassandra Kane, Lady Shiva, mother daughter stuff ever. Um, you get uh, Deathstroke being at his best. You get uh, Jason Todd um, being a remote human. Um, with Cassandra Kane and Commissioner Gordon. Um, like you get Jason where almost all of his uh bad boy uh I'm the bad kid rebel stuff, you know, it's stuff that I totally love, but you actually see him get stripped of all that and be humanized again in the midst of all this chaos. And I love it. Um but cause he basically is the last Batman standing on Earth at the moment. Um and, right, so last member of the uh, Bat family, uh, him and Cassandra Kane, um, right? And but meanwhile, you know, if you've read Un- Deceased, that you know that uh, Damien and like is in space and he's coming back um, as Batman. But uh, that's another thing in the future. But uh, you know, whenever the future happens, uh, but <laughs> whenever that happens, <laughs> whenever yes. that happens. But, uh, it is in the future at this point. Yeah, it is in the future. But uh, beyond that, man, uh, like you get honestly the best creeper that I've seen in forever. 
Like, we haven't had good Creeper in a hot minute, and this is A-game Creeper. Um, but um, I got to say this, just the full-blown, the best thing is that you get a well-done, full-blown, full super-powered zombie Wonder Woman. Dang. And with that, you get to see, you have this whole dramatic speech from Vandal Savage about, I've survived the dawn of time, blah, blah, blah. I'm not scared of anything. And then he sees a zombie Wonder Woman and poops his pants. And it's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, um, Sav- Savage has seen some things. He's There's seen no some things, but that. Zombie Wonder Woman topped all his things. and um, Yeah, he's like, nope. And so I, I had the most fun reading deceased unkillables number two and one so there's only two issues but i'm telling you they'll be the best two issues you read um of any zombie related thing since before glenn died um and (laughs) so that's great um on the x-force front um like i still am reading x-force and i'm still reading the x-men books i said i'm reading um which is x-men and X Force, that might be it. Um, but X Force, uh, they've got a fully healed Domino back, and there's one of the things that's uncomfortable. I'm very interested in is the fact that a uh, Domino made Colossus promise that when she died, she'd be brought back with all of her emotional pain and scarring and all that stuff. And it appears that they did not listen to her wishes. Ooh. Like that they straight uh disrespected her last wishes for their own community and uh like desires. So it it's just opening the doors to some more questionable things. But uh X Force uh number nine was really solid. It was obviously in a different arc, but you know, that's just I'm still enjoying the X Men bubble. Uh the actual x-men issue is um you know not one of the the best but it gave a really good space issue with the um like what are the aliens the the brood Um, brood is back yes but it was the brood really well done you so you get an accuser and you get some well done brood um so yeah i haven't been reading but i caught an article recently that piqued my interest for at least a moment because you say brood and you go and then they also said probably best brood in like forever and it's that's a pretty strong statement it's the best brood i've read since the 90s easily um uh but then also like with the flip side x-men really does this thing where they bring up something controversial or deep and then leave it alone forever (laughs) Um, because the last issue of X-Men before this had Nightcrawler questioning his faith and struggling and... Right. Uh, yeah, you mentioned that. And they didn't remotely address it. And then they had an issue with Nightcrawler that took place after the fact that also didn't remotely address it. Um, so whatever. Yeah, so I picked up that giant that giant size, which I'm assuming you're referencing. Um, yeah. And then I picked that up and Hellion's... Um, because I was like, oh, there's a big number one on it. I'll give it a shot. And we've promised all of you, our wonderful listeners, that we would take a look at number ones. And, well, we haven't gotten to that part of the show yet. But neither of those are on my list this week. <laughs> that was, uh, I will say this, that uh, um, that Giant Size X-Men number one was the most watered down, pointless filler issue of an X-Men comic I've read since before Hickman took over. Um, yeah, I wanted really, really awesome uh nightcrawler and got some great visuals and that's about it yeah that was yeah that was super disappointing um so but buy comics kids um and then (laughs) buy all the comics all the comics please um then jessica jones blind spot number six um which as you and i talked about in the beforehand this is a physical release of what was a digital exclusive Mm -hmm. And um, I'm telling you, this is Jessica Jones at her best. And it's the best representation of Jessica Jones I've seen in a minute. So if you like want to show Marvel and the other companies that physical is still important, uh, buy their digital release now that it's in physical, because I'm telling you, it was super dope. Um, But the whole thing boils down to uh, Jessica Jones and Luke are having a birthday party for their little girl. And... um, 
all these superheroes that have busy days keep interrupting. And just <laughs> drop by little presents. So you straight up have like uh they wake up and their kid is missing and they start freaking out and she hulk is in the kitchen eating cupcakes with the kid before breakfast and um gets in abrupt trouble for that and because she hulk ate the cake they have to go get a cake and then thor drops by and turns out that the present she hulk dropped off was like some mystical demon summoning charm and he has to go put it somewhere away from evil but he eats the cake and it's just like a lot of like okay, this is fun, but then a supervillain drops by to uh, take his revenge on Jessica, and then he gets morally wounded when he realizes he's ruining a kid's birthday party. Um, Did an entire comic book just explode? Because my brain is processing all the words you just said in a sentence. <laughs> but, it, I mean, it's super great that there's straight up a dude was there to kill Jessica, but then he feels bad that he was messing up the kid's birthday party. I'm like, I'm sorry, little one. <laughs> he's like, do you think killing mom wouldn't make the party sad? Um, but whatever. Uh, so I, I had a blast with Jessica Jones blind spot. I like, if you remotely like the characters, even in the Netflix incarnation, this is something you should pick up. Um, and then last one, I, uh, also, this was one of those deals where when we drove to our local comic book shop to support it before, you know, the poop hit the fans, um, I went to my shop that is most longest running. It's been one of my biggest supporters and I dropped all the dollars on all the books, like whatever I could physically manage. Well, by the time I got to shop number two, I was out of comics to buy. Um, <laughs> so like, I started I, buying, I started buying trades. Well, that's the thing. Like, uh, at, <laughs> at the other shop, they had, uh, trades 50% off, um, Ooh. which is where a lot <laughs> of my money went. Um, but so what I did was uh, to supplement, like supporting that dude, I started picking up mangas and uh, I've recently got into Demon Slayer, the anime, and okay. uh, the first season is 26 episodes and it's really long and it's great. Um, and who knows when a season two of that's coming out. Um, so I picked up the books that jump in where the anime ends so if you are a fan of the anime of demon slayer and you want to continue the story without having to wait for ever for the tv show to hit you can pick up uh demon slayer starting with issue or with volume seven of the manga and be right where you left off in the story um, so that's what I did. I like thumbed through the mangas to figure out where I needed to jump in. So I picked up seven. It's great. Minus, you know, hearing the specific voice actor that you're used to. If you're new to Demon Slayer and you want to try that it, after the series, you can pick up issue seven. And so that's my other recommendation for that. So what's the basic premise? I'm not familiar with Demon Slayer. Okay. So hook, hook us let up. Me, let me tell you about Demon Slayer. Um, it's beautiful by the way. Um, but uh, they, it's a, I'm not going to say feudal Japan ish era, but it's a feudal ish Japan ish time um, as far as technology and whatnot. Um, but there are cities with more stuff, but whatever. Um, there are demons, but their demons are a lot more Buffy the Vampire Slayer demons, as to speak, of, um, they're really more like vampires. Um, but it's also more, it's, their demons are straight up zombie vampires or zompires as Joss Whedon coined the term. Um, if a demon draws blood on another human, they become infected and turn into a demon. Um, and they have to, and they mm -hmm. eat humans. So, I mean, they're straight up zombie vampires, but, um, they can't be out in the sunlight, um, Whoever they were before they were infected, they become some twisted version of that. But they have to devour human flesh, and they can only be killed with a specific type of blade um, and the sunlight. Oh, interesting. So, so like, it, you can they can either be killed by sunlight or by a very, very specific blade. Um, and so the story picks up. There's this little dude, and he goes to sell some wood. 
and uh, when he comes back, his entire family has been slaughtered by a demon, and and uh, he's got his little sister is left living, so he's trying to take her to a doctor or whatever, and she turns into a demon uh, in the process. Um, and literally three seconds after she turns into a demon, a demon slayer, which is straight up like a rogue Ronin samurai that roams land, ridding them of these demons. Um, but they have a whole organization and hierarchy. Um, a demon slayer shows Jeez. up to kill his sister and he believes the little dude believes that he can find a cure for this, save his sister and that he's willing to die to prove it. Um, is and that all? <laughs> that's like the first five minutes. Um, wow. Anime uh, does tend to be pretty packed. But so straight up, they this kid becomes a demon slayer um, because he is going to set out on a quest to rid the world of demons, but also heal his little sister. But through training or whatever else, his sister is yet to consume human flesh, so she's still innocent. Um, and But she has to sleep a lot to compensate her uh, lack of nutrition. Um, so he walks around carrying his little sister in a box on his backpack. Um, so in his backpack at all times is a cute little adorable demon girl. And he's got zany sidekicks and he has to go against this self-righteous order of demon slayers. And, uh, but it really is just like one of the best stories as far as, uh, uh, sibling love, sacrifice, um, training and stuff like that. Uh, there's a lot of elements that are kind of like airbendery of like, uh, when you learn a certain technique, uh, you can master different elements. So this one dude, his sword techniques manifest water. One dude manifests lightning. Um, but the other thing that I thought was fantastic is that like when he kills these demons, because these were at one time people, he has right. moments of remorse with them where they get to like repent or share their life stories or have someone just hear their sorrow over who they'd become. And he like legit sits and prays with them as they die. And so <laughs> it's just like this whole like, man, this is bananas. But uh, I straight up got into it because, you know, with Comic-Con culture, I was around so many people um, cosplaying as the main female Nezco. And uh, I'm like, OK, I need to see what this is about. And I straight up b started watching this anime because of cosplayers. So, oh, well, and we've come full circle. We've come full circle. That's Which is why we need Comic-Cons. Right. Ah, uh, gonna miss the con circuit this summer. We now, really need like, that. dude, like, I'm just waiting for heroes to say they're not happening because I know they can't. Um, and be in June, there's no way a mid June show is still gonna happen. Yeah. Um, but Heroes Con is one of the longest running shows, second to San Diego. Heroes yep. Con, I believe this is their 40th year, and they they were That's my pretty first, high, yeah, they were my first con. And honestly, like, I think that was going to be my last time doing that show with Faith and Fandom. Like, I was kind of, like, <gasps> going to back off some cons. And so yeah. I had this whole exit strategy planned, and now I don't even know what I'm doing. Because I also release, my goal every year is to release Faith and Fandom to premiere at Heroes Con. Right. Yep. Because online sales are cool and all, but I write those books to be the outlet at the con. And if I don't have a con... <laughs> like what am I doing? Um, so Hector's gonna need a really big hug when this is over. I am, and I'm a uh, physical touch person. That is my love language, and um, I am currently, uh, you know, dietarily deprived on my cuddles. <laughs> so, oh, oh. So what you got? All right, all right. So I'll save the best for last. Um, but for me, over the last couple weeks. I have been telling all of you about Ascender when it used to be Descender 
and Ascender 10 came out over this period, and it was kind of the end of one of the current arcs. But per the usual, um, they've put me in a position that made me have a bunch of feels in the middle of a book that I wasn't prepared to have a bunch of feels in. Um, and that's kind of what this entire series has been embodied by with, you know, the sci-fi, like, life journey into space kind of thing, hunting for things. Well, they're still kind of hunting for things, but... Um, Every now and then in the middle of the story, you basically just get punched in the face and it's like, haha, you're going to have to cry now. And issue 10 was one of those issues. And I love that feel from comics because, A, you don't necessarily know where those are coming, especially in a longer narrative. And Ascender and Descender have been a very long narrative that's been pieced together. But then the very last panel of issue 10 you find out that some of your feels from back in descender were misplaced and you feel joy again and for anyone that's been reading that along with me i'm just gonna give you that much because you're gonna feel really sad in the middle of this book and then at the end of it you're going to cheer in a really strange way that you haven't cheered before because something wonderful has happened in the world of ascender so if, if you've not been listening to me, now's a great time to pick up the trades of Descender and catch up. I think the first part of Ascender is in trade as well now. So you can catch up on the whole thing while you're sitting at home and you should be reading comics. So read Descender and Ascender because it's really good. Um, I then also just have to say, because I mean, I think it's been clear that I really enjoy the character The Flash, but there's not always been super great storytelling going on like it's been really solid for the flash but it's not like mind-blowing williamson's just done amazing stuff since he took over the book a few years ago but 751 started kind of a two-parter between 751 and 752 where barry's been fighting yet another entity of the speed force and if you know (laughs) right (laughs) it's oh there's there's more speed force things that we can fight dude this is the flash there's always going to be speed force things that you can flash or Reverse Flash is going to come back for the 47,000th time with something new because he continues to jump the timeline as well. If we had poster children for what not to do in time travel, his name is Barry Allen. <laughs> um, because, wow, that dude just needs to stop. <laughs> but 751 really gives a really... Barry gets caught in a really tough situation again, which is also called Barry Allen. Um, and spoiler alert class, um, (laughs) Barry gets whacked for what the third or fourth time, which is why I have zero issue spoiling that because if you're not used to Barry Allen dying at this point, you're not reading the flash. Um, but they talk a lot about this and he finds his cosmic treadmill because he finds out that maybe he's not dead. Maybe he's somewhere in the speed force and something doesn't feel right he kind of feels like he's in a really weird episode of the twilight zone kind of thing everything's right but not and he can tell because he's barry allen he's the flash in fact it's so flash the way he figures it out is that the vibrations of that world didn't feel like the normal world to barry so he realized it had to be fake because it wasn't vibrating the way that the normal world does Okay. That's the Flash kid. That's the Flash kids. <laughs> You've now learned something. Um, so he's trying to figure out how to get through it, and he finds a cosmic treadmill because that's also how the Flash manages to mess with time is that stupid treadmill is always laying somewhere, just waiting for you to break the world and flashpoint again. Um, so he jumps on that bad boy and goes back in time. Now, I know you don't necessarily read a ton of Flash, only when but Batman I want to comes in, <laughs> right? I want to I want to test a theory here. Um, Barry Allen jumps on the cosmic treadmill to travel back in time to fix something in time. What moment in time does Barry Allen go to? Hmm. Yeah, I'm asking this because he goes here every freaking time. <laughs> Why though? So, yeah, if you haven't pieced it together, he literally goes back to the night that his mother died for the 47,000th time. Why are so, we doing this? 
because reverse flash is there and whenever a flash storyline gets lost you have to go back to earbird thon it's just how it works i don't write the comics but that's how it works so even though it sounds like i'm being kind of tongue-in-cheek against this i'm really enjoying it because the art was really really freaking great um across this series and it does look like we're going to look at that night again through yet again another lens and I am semi-fascinated by the fact that this is the moment in time that literally shapes Barry Allen's life. And we've looked at it thousands of different ways, it feels like, at this point. So as a Flash fan, I'm excited to see where this particular moment in time kind of goes through things again. And I guess that's why I also had Batman 91 on my list this week that... I'm pretty much DC this week where you were mostly you you weighed out Marvel. Um yeah. Marvel just didn't hit me this last couple of weeks. I read a ton of books this week, y'all. Like I saw your list or your posts and stuff. You were reading a ton. And it unfortunately made me feel really a bummer that most of those books I was like, yeah, this can just go back down here. Um but I will talk about a Marvel book in just a bit. But Batman 91, I know I've said I have a love-hate relationship. I still do. It still feels like the most 90s-looking Batman in forever, and I have mixed feelings about that. Yeah. But now that we can – that and the designer is just like, A, quite possibly the worst named and dressed supervillain since the Condiment King. And, yeah. Um, but I'm really compelled by what secret all these villains have. And that it's supposedly going to be more mind-blowingly earth-shattering than Tom King literally messing with our minds for 85 straight issues. Which means, hey, y'all, you better deliver at this point because (laughs) I'm really excited for what I wasn't excited for in a new Batman arc. Which means you've got a pretty big follow-through you need to hit here. And we're going to see a new Joker sidekick. We know... It's punchline, but she's straight to... up. And, and maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think I care the way other people care about that. Like, I, yeah, no, I I just said all those words, but it has nothing to do with punchline in my mind. Unless she is somehow the center of this thing, and they explain why, and it's utterly amazing. Just based on the art, I'm like, so you we have a sociopathic Harley now. Because otherwise, that's all it really looks for me. And you can you can at me on that one. I'm completely okay with it because I don't get it yet. But I guess we don't know yet. But um, Batman 91 was the Joker explaining the night with d- 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 the designer that all the other – that we saw bits and pieces of. He was retelling his side of it, and there was just some great moments in there and felt very Joker. Um, and – of course, the punchline to his entire tell- retelling of that night and the plan and everything was pretty epic. That I was like, "Yeah, that that was about the most Joker thing I've seen in a while." Well, um, as he's holding holding a bartender hostage to tell this story because he's already shot another bartender because he wasn't interesting. That I was like, "Yay, th- this is this is Batman. I'm okay." Well, and the fact that he's like uh, turned Harley into a Robin at this point, basically that. You know, we get a new Joker villain right, a new Joker sidekick right as Harley has officially become a DC hero. Um, Like, if she's in the Batcave working for Batman, that's where life is, you know. (laughs) Right? (laughs) And it was pretty fun. I I thought, like, Harley playing her video game that was real life was an entertaining moment of Batcaveness and just where she is and everything. Yeah, I mean, that's, and you couple that with what, you know, White Knight goodness, you know, then there's yep. a, a lot of Harley migration happening. But, you know, I'll stay off that so, so you have it. And here we are. That and here we are. Curse of the White Knight, number eight, um, the conclusion of this part of Sean Murphy's amazing run of, you know, the alternate universe, the alternate quasi animated the series continuance universe just 
wow. <laughs> that, as you said, the who Harley has become and who she is and Bruce going through a really crazy transition and learning about his history and who he is and the final face off with Azrael that I almost don't want to say too much because it's just really It didn't good. disappoint. It did not disappoint in the least. And there were significant events throughout the entire run um, that were that had consequences as we went down the road and just the classic back and forth you expect to see between Azrael and Bruce really came out even in this very different context of basically, you know, we're, we're the same, but different um, commentary, but so good. And so I know that you really enjoyed it. So I'll allow you to kind of jump in here as well that I, I don't have much more to say than that. You just need to read. If Sean Murphy has written a Batman thing, you should read it. <laughs> Well, did I tell you I went back and read uh, his other book, Punk Rock Jesus? Oh, yeah. You mentioned that briefly. Yeah. So, I mean, I went back just to see what his, you know, storytelling is. And his storytelling in general. Like, Sean Murphy is a fantastic storyteller. The way he writes and draws his stuff together is glorious. So, um, easily, I feel like this, you know... Despite what Birds of Prey will tell you, uh, this has been the best like year for Harley Quinn as far as storytelling across the board. Um, right. Between the book Harleen and between White Knight, b- both versions of White Knight, it's the best Harley we've gotten in forever. And just so much depth and what they've layered in. This is the most off the beaten path, but really well done Bat book. Period. And um, I and I'll just say this: the ending of it, like I'm not going to say anything to spoil things, but I'm excited, <laughs> right? So right, um, because I I can't, I don't want to spoil things, but Hector's excited, so there you go. Um, yeah. So that, uh, yeah, you can pretty much fill in the blanks on that one because yes, uh, when I hit the end of that, I was like, oh, Hector's a happy boy. Hector's a happy boy. <laughs> yes, so much. And so. the way that they have already presented the individual. I'm like, Oh yeah. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. And that clearly that this story is just going to keep on rolling, which is great. Cause there's no reason for it not to. Nope. He he's on, he's en fuego. So he might as well just keep rolling with it. So I think those were our pulls. So now we want to kind of give you as we have in some of the other ish, the last episode, um, we want to talk about the number ones that are worth your time right now. And so Hector, I'll let you go first and I'll wrap up with, I, I always cheat. We try to do one and I ended up with two again this week and That's sorry, okay. not sorry. And uh, you know, you have your moment. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Uh, I, Oh, by the way, I didn't like put this in my pools and I'm not going to say it deserves to be in the pools, but I picked up when I was just trying to support the shop, I picked up, the Power Rangers Ninja Turtle crossover. Mm-hmm. Um, like the one where the power, the turtles actually become Power Rangers. Yep. It was super fun. <laughs> um, so I would honestly say if you are a fan of turtles or Power Rangers, read that. Um, it, I didn't get number one. I just picked up the one where they actually became turtles or Power Rangers. Um, but anyway, uh, I am trying to follow the lead here and, grab while we have them grab a new number one every week and one chris isn't grabbing so i decided to (laughs) bite the bullet and uh pick up terminator versus transformers because the cover i got the variant cover and the cover was cool you know you know judging books by its covers always turns out well and um yeah it works out great so i uh picked that up uh so i will tell you as a number one to pick up not this one um <laughs> this don't do it uh i don't just, i don't think that's the point of this segment but, but. I, i'm a, i'm gonna I'm <laughs> tell you don't do it um you know how on cereal boxes in the 90s they would put some poorly animated poorly worded cartoon of your favorite character on the back of a cereal box to attempt to get you to buy cereal to get a toy this was that in print form um and 
they might fully develop a story out of this, but man, it won't be worth what you spend on it. So <laughs> I got a number one just to tell you if you should get this number one. And that is a hard no that you should not. <laughs> Ouch. But do get Power Rangers Turtles now available in trade format. Is it? I think so. I thought it was. I wasn't sure if it was yet or not. But either way, yes, you should totally get Power Rangers and Turtles because that was super fun. Because um, <laughs> that was awesome. That was great. But no, Transformers Terminator. So, no, hard pass. Okay, so I, I I read I read a book. There were a ton of number ones in the last couple of weeks. Let's let's just first acknowledge that, and probably some out there that some folks are going to enjoy. But for me, I think one of the most interesting books that I saw kind of out of the corner of my eye and I legit almost didn't pick it up because I didn't know what it was and wasn't really sure what it was going to be. But I was like, nope, I I should do the thing. Um, Just like you picked up a Transformers versus Terminator book. And I picked up Stealth number one, which is a new image book. And yeah, I'm in. Um, stealth is a Detroit based superhero, um, which you usually do not hear that sentence uttered very often, if ever. Um, and I don't want to go too far down this road because there is a twist at the very end of the first issue that they did an extremely good job of not giving away as it was unfolding, but it's about a father and his son, his son, is high school age, so you got a Peter Parker type person here um, who's taking care of his father who clearly is developing Alzheimer's. And you don't really know what that means, but that's the interaction that you see between father and son. And you are introduced to Stealth, who is a superhero that has a certain amount. It's kind of like a flight suit type of thing. It's not quite Iron Man, but um, it allows the superhero to fly and basically is doing, you know, Spider-Man type stuff, but in Detroit that it's breaking up, you know, shop robberies and stuff like that. And people getting beat up, just stopping it, that it's a retake the streets kind of story. And that's what I'm going to give you for the setup is you need to know that father and son are in kind of a difficult relationship because dad keeps forgetting stuff and he feels responsible for his dad. And that, We have a superhero in Detroit that is working kind of to take back the streets, if you will. And the book ends in the setup to the premise, which is why I'm not saying it, because this really caught me off guard and I love just about everything about it. So if you're looking for something that feels very Spider-Man-esque, but has an interesting twist in it, Stealth is definitely going to be worth your time. And then my honorable mention for this time around, because I didn't do a lot of Marvel stuff, is I did pick up Outlawed number one, which is basically Champions number whatever number they left off at. Um, But it is basically the Champions group. um, And it's kind of going back to an incident that has occurred that has placed them kind of on the outs with everybody. So most of your your favorite Champions characters are present in this, and it's just off-the-wall Avenger-esque, Champion-esque type bad guy slash world is literally sideways type stuff, but with a team that a lot of folks have enjoyed in the past, and I do enjoy this teen version of superheroes out of the marvel universe that you know really make up a lot of folks that you don't see a ton of so you got nova you've got viv um oh so many different it all all of the people that were in champions so if you're looking for that feel good teen level team book out of marvel uh outlawed has a really kind of cool twist to it that is just very comic booky and very fun. And every now and then we just need a fun comic book. That's um, a big team of folks doing cool things. Yep. It's that simple. And so Hector and I definitely want to just continue to remind you guys that we do want to hear what you're reading and everything. So we're going to remind you guys again, you can give us a call at 706 
530-1412 and leave us a 30-second message about your favorite read and you may be on the next episode. So if you've kept something on your COVID-19, you know, uh, reading catch up, give us a call, leave us that message, and we'll include you in the next episode so you yourself can tell all the fans out there what you've been enjoying and we can share somebody else's joy with the world. So we love hearing about what you guys are pulling and reading. So don't forget to hit us up. We try to be about Friday is when we want to gather stuff to be able to record. So give us a call. And we'll feature you right here on the show. But that's going to do us for us here at the Pull List Podcast. Episode number two, season two, is now in the can and now in your ears. But we couldn't possibly do this alone. As many of you know, we take on this journey of podcast and fandom with two other amazing podcasts that are part of the Love Thy Nerd podcast network. First, we have Humans of Gaming with Drew and Chris. They do interviews with game designers, producers, and creators and really get to the heart of why they do the things that they do. And then we have Free Play Podcast with Bubba, Matt, and Kate that covers just about everything nerdy and fun that you can think of. And, well, the COVID has them kind of locked into their homes playing lots of video games and doing other crazy stuff too. And they talk about it weekly and then give it to you to listen to. It's crazy fun. But like we said, Hector and I want to thank each and every one of you for continuing to make us your primary comic book knowledge factory on a near weekly basis. So don't leave us hanging. Rate and review the show on your favorite podcasting app of choice. We're on the iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, and so many more. Guys, community is what's going to keep us all together. So thanks for listening. And remember, kids, read more comics. I'm going to take all seven continents of the game of risk.